uh, right into the Word today, and I want you to uh, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter number 8, and we're going to look at uh, the, the restorative power of God. God is able to restore our lives. He has and still does continuously. He restores. As you're turning there, all the kids are going to go to kids' church and uh, enjoy that time of ministry. We are living in a very unusual time for us. It is not unusual in the scope of history, but it is unusual for us. It is not unusual because it's difficult. It's not unusual because there are sickness or disruptions or rioting or wars or rumors of wars. Those things have been going on for hundreds and even thousands of years. It is unusual for us today because, in my opinion, there has never been a time period in history in which there were so many voices on a national and international scale that were propagating such agendas and being so negative to be anti-Christian. We have news cycles on so many channels that are 24-7, and somehow they think they have to come up with a story and so they do come up with some really good whoppers, don't they? I mean, some stories, don't they? Is what I, I meant to say. And that's the unusualness of the time period in which we live. There have always been difficulties and there have always been hardships. And yet today, though, we hear negative voice after negative voice after negative voice. I'm thankful that this Bible talks about good news. The gospel is good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. And we're going to talk today about good news. We must feed ourselves on God's word and not feed on what this world has to tell us. The world has been wrong and is wrong, but Christ is always right. So Romans chapter 8, verse 33 through 39. Let's read this, and then we're going to turn to a verse in the Old Testament. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus." That is a mouthful, isn't it? Those are great and powerful promises to us. He says it is God who has brought us into a position of justification. And it is God who continually intercedes on our behalf. In other words, Christ is even today, right now, presenting the blood that he shed on the cross before God the Father and saying the price has been paid for their sin. It is not something that he just did 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood on the cross then, but his blood is ever being presented before the throne of God to say the price has been paid for all of their sin. The price has been paid for all of their sin. He's ever interceding for us. Don't, aren't you glad that Christ is interceding for you today? Amen. He's constantly bringing before the Father the reality of what he did 2,000 years ago. And that is the reality of what was planned thousands, possibly millions of years ago. God is in the business of bringing us into a position of restoration and keeping us restored. And it is not by how strong we are or how good we are or how well we perform, but it is a matter of God's strength working in us. Restoration means is to turn back or to bring back. When we restore something, we bring it back or we restore it. We're returning it to. 
And that's what God has done. We see God gave us that uh, promise way, way back in Genesis in uh, the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, he dealt with the sin, but he also made them immediate promise that there would become one who would crush the head of Satan who had tempted them to do what was wrong. He immediately brought that promise of restoration. When sin and corruption had corrupted the human race and God decided to flood the earth with water and preserve Noah and his family, it was a sign in the rainbow that God would never destroy the planet in this way again. God saved Noah through the flood because God was restoring mankind. In Isaiah, giving uh, leadership to Jacob and Esau, Jacob had to be restored to God and to his brother Esau. There are people today who need to be restored to God and restored to one another. I want you to turn to an Old Testament passage, 2 Samuel chapter number 9, and we're going to look at this, and I think we're going to be very, very encouraged by what happens here. Let me give you a little background on it. David is a uh, now the king. He's been anointed king, but Saul was the king. But now Saul is gone. Saul has been killed along with Jonathan, Saul's son. Saul was the king, Jonathan his son, and David, Jonathan and David were best friends. They were tight, as tight as you could get. And yet Saul is dead, and now Jonathan is dead, and now David is the king. And so David, I don't know, this is kind of interesting to me because it, it's almost like an interruption of the, of the chronology of what is happening in 2 Samuel. It's almost like David just woke up one day and, and just had a God thought. And he said this in 2 Samuel chapter number 9. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the Saul's household named Ziba, and they summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he, the king asked, and Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makar, son of Emil, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Mekah, son of Emil. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down and paid honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. He said, don't be afraid, David said to him. For I will surely show kindness for your sake to your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. What a tremendous story. Here, King Saul is the king. I mean, King David, he is the king. He is, he is ready to rule and go and love and bless and protect. But then one day he just says, is there anyone? Is there even just one person who's still alive who's of the household of Saul? Is there just one? And we see here the heart of the king to say, I know that I'm the king of a nation, but I'm still interested in the one. I want to share with you today that's the very attitude that God has about you. That he is king of this universe, but he seeks you out Isn't that what Jesus said when he came? He said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so Jesus made it very clear. He has come to point out that individual person wherever they may be found. And that's the way God is with us today. You're going through whatever you're going through. You're facing whatever you're facing. But God is saying, I'm interested in you as an individual. It's not just as a corporate body, but you as a person. I know your name. The word tells us, and Jesus said in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, all of that, he says, hey, listen, uh, God is so intricately involved in your life, he knows the number of hairs on your head. I used to have a greater number than I have today. Some of us are in that position, right? 
God knows everything about us. He knows how tall we are. He knows where we're going, where we've been. He knows everything about it. And he seeks us out because he loves the individual and not just the corporate, not just the many. That's the God who takes care of us as individuals. Jonathan's son was crippled because when he was a baby, there was a, a disturbance and the maid is his maid actually picked him up and was running with him and tripped and fell and both of his legs were broken beyond repair and so he was crippled. We all face that. We've been crippled by a fall as well. We've been crippled by Adam and Eve's sin. We've been crippled by our own sin. We're emotionally damaged, we're physically damaged, we're relationally damaged. Every one of us have sinned and yet God says that is not a barrier to my loving you and caring for you. In fact, that's what draws me to you is because you understand and realize that you have a need. It is the proud that God opposes. It's those who say, I've got it all together. I don't need any help, I'm good. God says, oh fine, then live your life. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Aren't you thankful that when we come to God and we say, God, I'm, I'm a little messed up here. I need your help. God is gravitated toward us. And he reaches out and says, that's who I wanna serve. That's who I wanna save. That's who I wanna help. We're living in a, in a really weird time, aren't we? Where all of the, the negative stuff is being presented to us and all of the what ifs and all of this could happen and that could happen and what about this and what about that? No, I can't, oh, what's going on? We're facing all of these difficulties and yet God is the one who's constantly telling us nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ. Though we have been crippled by a fall and the king has sought us out, he has looked at us as individuals and he has sought us out and he says, I'm interested in you as an individual and he has found us. Uh, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was in a place called Lodabar. And a little later he talks about Lodabar. When you look up Lodabar, as a, it was a place, a region, a town. Uh, it gives the definition of Lodabar. And here's the definition of Lodabar. No pasture. <laughs> you know you're in trouble when you're at a place where it's described by what it doesn't have. You know? I remember the first trip out to New Mexico. Lisa and I went out there on a missions trip. We took about 15 teenagers with us and we traveled all over New Mexico and different churches and doing different things. And, and I, I never had my first experience in, in a real desert. I was raised in Florida. It's very lush. It's tropical. It rains every day. And, and I'd never been in a desert before. And so I was in New Mexico. We flew into Albuquerque. And we went all the way down to Las Cruces and Roswell and, and um, back up to Albuquerque. And my, my, my thought was in that moment, with, I've never seen so much of nothing so well fenced. It was nothing there. It was just, it was just sand and, and little shrubs. But it was fenced tremendously. I was very impressed with the fencing. But I'm thinking, what is fenced? Are they afraid the little cactus are going to escape? I was trying to figure it out. And you could describe New Mexico, I think, as there is no pasture there. <laughs> there is no water. And that's where's where Mephibosheth was. Maybe you're at a place where you say, man, I feel like there's no nourishment where I'm at. I feel like there's, there's nothing there. There's nothing green. There's nothing growing. There's nothing alive. There's nothing there. And God says, I will take you out of the place that you've been and I will rescue you. And then he says, I'm going to bring you to my, my table. I'm going to bring you to my place. I'm going to make provision for you that you had no idea or dream could even take place. You had no idea or dream that you would be actually be dining at the king's table, but that's the very God that we serve. He says, I want you to come and dine with me. And some of us are feeling like today, like, well, I feel like there's nothing but trouble. I feel like there's nothing but discouragement. I feel like there's nothing but, and because we're hearing the negative voices, and yet I believe within the body of Christ, we are rising up to say, hey, wait a minute. Three months ago, we were dealing with predictions. Today, we're dealing with statistics, and God is still God. God is still God. He was God when the he was God last year in 2019. He was God when false predictions were being made, and he's God when statistics are being revealed, and he's going to be God next year when all this is blown over because that's who he is. He's not adjusted or diminished because of what's going on. He is God, and he says, 
I know that you're crippled. I'm seeking you out. I have found you in a dry and a barren land, and I'm bringing you to my table. And therefore, we come back to Romans chapter 8. He says, who has justified us? Christ has justified us. Not only has he already justified us, but he is ever interceding for us. He is always petitioning for us. Every day, the blood of Christ is being presented to the Father to say, it is enough for their sins. They belong to us. You may be in a place right now where you're saying, you know what, I feel completely stressed out. When we live in a stressful time, we need to remind ourselves of who God is. When we live in a stressful time, we need to remind ourselves this is an opportunity and it is not as big of a problem as some would try to make it. This is an opportunity because when things are dark, even a dim candle shines brightly. You may feel like you're a dim candle. I would pronounce to you, you are the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. When everyone's walking around fearful, it is the body of Christ who stands strong. When everyone is in dismay, it is the body of Christ who stands up and says, I'm going to be strong. Can I talk to you for a moment? Just as a, a pastor from my heart to your heart. These are not unprecedented times. They are just unprecedented for us. And this is our finest hour if we will take the opportunity that has been granted to us and say, you know what? We're going to be smart and we're gonna be wise, and we're going to be confident. Because tough times don't last, but tough people do. And God has called us to be tough. I know that there are some who in, in, in the church circle and in the world would, would try and present Christ as, as someone very soft and gentle and lovely and kind and has a, a better you know, time with lambs and holding little baby lambs and petting them and that's kind of their image of Christ. I would declare to you that, yes, that is a side of Christ. He's very gentle and very compassionate. I would also declare to you that Christ is a bold lion roaring. He is also a mighty king of kings and lord of lords. And when he speaks, the mountains tremble. When he speaks, everyone pays attention. And I believe in it is in these times when we are uninundated with the negative that we resist that stand up and say my god is still god my god is still god and so i will not be fearful i will i will not cower i will stand up and be brave i will be wise and i will be brave you don't have to be brave and you don't have no one else has to be brave i'm not going to shame anyone into not being brave but we are going to be brave i don't it, Whatever you want to do is fine, but I'm going to be brave because my God says nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ. So what are we going to be? We're going to be wise. What are we going to be? We're going to be brave because of why? Because we serve a mighty God. He says, I've got this. I've got this. It's okay because I've got you. Now, I... Uh, I don't know what it was like to be in, in uh, World War II. I don't know what it was like during that time period other than what I've read and studied and looked at in documentaries and so forth. But I do know this, that uh, World War II was, as far as America was concerned, about a four or five year endeavor. It was much longer for those in Europe. In fact, John Ryan is uh, one of our elders and his mother is British. Uh, she's passed away now, but she was British. She was in the vicinity of London while they were being bombed and would have to go down every day into one of the bomb shelters. But she lived through it. She was a child, but she lived through it. And she got married and had like eight kids or something. It was enormous, you know? So here's the good news. We're gonna make it through this because God is good and because God is on our side. So no need to fear. So here's my encouragement to you. I wanna encourage you to learn again to relax. I'm gonna encourage you to do something that causes your emotions to do backflips. Did you get that? 
Do something that causes your emotions to be refreshed and replenished. It may be fishing, it may be hunting, it may be shopping, hiking. I don't know what it is. But God is saying to us, relax, I've got this. And in your relaxation, that's when the confidence oods out of you that just says, hey, God's got this. We're in good shape. So we move forward. This is an opportunity for the body of Christ to be strong. This is an opportunity for us to win souls. I want to make a bold statement right here, and I want to make sure you understand it in context. And, and I'm not trying to describe everyone who's fearful during this time. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. So please, please, please don't hear what, please hear what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. There are people who are fearful of this. Fear is a gift from God. Fear is a good thing. Done wrong, it's a horrible thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So God gave us fear for a reason. If you walk across that street that this church is on without looking left and right, you... okay? So fear causes you to, to look left and right, okay? So fear is a good thing. Fear gone crazy is not a good thing. There are people who are absolutely petrified during this season of existence. But you must ask yourself, why are they petrified? Why are they petrified? There are some who are, who are very upset because of medical conditions and they don't want to get a virus because it could really do them in. I, I get that. But there are other people who are healthy and strong. I was talking to one pastor. I won't mention his name. Uh, but I was talking to one pastor. He, he pastors a pretty large church. And, and we, were, we were just talking about how different people are responding to it. This is what he said. Okay, this is what he said. He said, I've got 86-year-old people on oxygen who are wanting to be greeters at the church and shake everybody's hand and hug everybody's neck. And I have 30 years old, 30 year olds sucking their thumb in their house and won't come out. You guys okay out there? Okay. okay. Why are people afraid? I'm not saying this is why everyone's afraid. I'm saying this is why many people are afraid. Many people are afraid to get this virus because they don't want to die, and they don't want to die because they're not right with God. They know they're not right with God. They know that their sins are still on their lives. They know they have no advocate with the Father. They know they've made no relationship with Jesus Christ, and they are afraid to die. And that's why they're afraid of going out of their house. Not everyone has that condition, but many people do. Here is our opportunity as the body of Christ to exhibit a confidence that this world will look at us and go, what is up with you? What is up with you? Why do you have such confidence? Because the worst thing that could happen to me is I'd die and I'd go to heaven. That's the worst thing that could happen to me. Now, I assure you, I don't want to die today. I don't even want to die this week. I have some things I want to do. Okay? But if I die, I know where I'm going. But if they die, they don't know where they're going. And that's why they're afraid. This is our opportunity. This is an opportunity that is presented to only a few generations, and we have the opportunity to stand bold and strong and move forward. I think this whole thing kind of caught us off guard because we trusted the guesswork of experts. We've learned our lesson, haven't we? Y'all are coming around. We're, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Romans tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. What is the kingdom all about? What is the kingdom about? It's about Romans chapter 14. It's about the kingdom of God. It's not about eating and drinking and all of that. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. And that's what this world needs to see. I want to ask you the question this morning. You may have a very holy and godly and, and awesome fear that is very, very good, but you might have a fear that is not good. It is a fear of saying, you know what, I, 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 know I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm not right with God. I know I'm not right with God. 
And I know that if I were to die today, whether in a car accident on the way home or from anything else, I know that I wouldn't go to heaven. I know I would not spend eternity with Christ. And if that's the situation that you're in, that can be remedied today. That can be changed today. Your eternal destiny can be altered in this very moment. If you'll turn to God and say, God, I need Jesus as my savior. I need Christ to forgive me of my sin. Would you please, please forgive me of my sin. I recognize I'm broken. Like Mephibosheth, I've been crippled by sin. Lord, please forgive me of my sin. He will, he promised that he will. And right now, in this moment, he can transition you from a state of, of awful fearfulness to a state of confidence that God is, has saved you and Christ has paid the price for your sins.